Hello everyone. Welcome to Tea with GPS. Today we have one of the most celebrated diplomats of India, Ambassador Nirupama Menon Rao. He was not only the Foreign Secretary of India, but also ambassador to three crucial places, Sri Lanka, China and the United States. She has been very active even after leaving the Foreign Service engaged in discussions, engaged in various kinds of um, writings, and uh, very active in following United States and China particularly. She's, her most recent preoccupations is creating peace in South Asia through music. Having spent all her life trying to create peace in South Asia through diplomacy, she is now trying music, whether she can succeed in that or not. So we are indeed pleased that she is with us today to talk generally about situation. Welcome, Nirupama. Thank you, Ambassador Srinivasan. It's a pleasure to be on your show. I look forward very much to our discussion. Nirupama, you may remember when we decided to have this conversation today, we were expecting that the US elections would be over and there would be a president-elect. But unfortunately, we haven't reached that stage yet. They have been stuck at 253 and 143 for several days. But it is more or less certain that the Biden-Harris duo will come to power in the next, maybe next minute, before we finish our conversation, that decision may be taken. So what is your overall view on what has happened about this change? Did you expect it? And what is the extent of the change that is going to occur? Well, if you uh, went by the polls, Ambassador, you would def everybody was expecting an almost landslide Biden victory. But as uh, the results uh, seem to show, and as they have definitely shown, there has been no landslide. And the election uh, has become pretty much a cliffhanger in many ways. And... Uh, we were all waiting with bated breath. Uh, even now, we really don't know uh, when uh, the election will be called and when Mr. Biden uh, will be announced as the next president of the United States, as the winner of the election, that is. So uh, in uh, the short answer to your question is, uh, did I expect a Biden win? I would say yes and no, uh, because uh, if you just went by the polls, yes, definitely. But going by the events of the last few days and the very dramatic sort of moves made by the Trump presidency and the manner in which somebody said to President Trump needs to get his boy pants on uh, in the sense that he was not being adult enough when it came to countenancing uh, what was going on. But in the, in the end, I think democracy is winning and I hope it will win. It's very important that in the United States, which is essentially the fighting head of modern democracy in the world today, that um, we need a stable outcome to the election. And more importantly, we need a stable next four years. Well, that is a crucial question, because I took the line right from the beginning that if poetic justice has any relevance to politics, he must lose. I never said he will lose because the damage that he has done to the whole system and the various things he did on his own without any advice from his uh, main advisors, going against science. There are so many things that he had done which did not suit the genius of the United States and also did not suit the prominence of the United States in the globe, in, on the globe. And therefore, I felt that uh, if there is such a thing as reward and punishment, he is likely to lose. And it has turned, up to be, turned out to be right that it has proved to be a referendum of his uh, four years. But in the beginning, when the results started coming, I was myself surprised as to how 80 million people are still willing to vote for him. Isn't that remarkable that even with this record, 
he has such a following and do you think trumpism even if trump leaves office yes even if you can't exactly define what trumpism is all about the fact that um, you know i uh, the statistics i had was 68% of the electorate voted uh, for him and uh, what it indicates i believe is that america and everybody is saying this america today is a deeply polarized society the second point is yes it has been a referendum on mr trump but the referendum you know you can interpret it both ways 68% of the people have voted for mr trump voted for his policies voted for his uh, philosophy of governance as it were or non governance so uh, how is the next president going to deal with this polarization is the question of course uh, the president traditionally deals with both houses of congress you're going to have probably a republican majority in senate although there is a runoff as far as two seats in georgia are concerned right. you're going to have congress d- dominated by uh, the, the democrats well let's see how it all works and mr trump may go back to uh, his life in the media he may run his own radio show or his own tv show so he will be that familiar compound ghost i think constantly uh, for the biden presidency but don't you think he will be more than that is he going to confine himself to his old role as a businessman and a media person but he would be a constant problem for biden in the sense that he has this support and he might use every opportunity with his eyes the next election because he has served only once so he can probably contest again in 2024 so therefore that would be one problem and uh, he has already started questioning the election itself and he is on for a, a lawsuit several lawsuits and probably a fight in the supreme court so this will affect the functioning of the government at least in the next 2 months what he will be up to even when he is in charge with biden as the president elect you don't have any anxieties on, on that score uh, well i am anxious and i'm sure that the vast majority of rational uh, you know thinking america is concerned about uh, what the next 2 months what the next 6 months could hold for the country so in that sense it really takes away from the result of the election and uh, it uh, imposes certain constraints and certain obstacles i believe in the way of the functioning of the biden presidency at least in its early stages right and uh, new yorker had a story you, i don't know whether you have seen it that uh, president trump if he lost the election would be in deep trouble personally hmm. because he so many personal debts he has there are so many lawsuits there are so many problems that he has either to leave the country or go to jail that was the conclusion that new yorker had drawn yes, yes, so such a, is that is that possible such a thing can happen it could very well happen because the long arm of the law does not spare anybody and uh, mr trump has been such a lightning rod for controversy throughout his presidency there has there been so many so many uh, scandals that are included against him and uh, his lack of uh, sensitivity and concern for universally accepted norms of governance i think that is what that is what has brought the image of america down in the last 4 years uh, you have seen america's retrenchment in many ways uh, on the global stage and very often that uh, as we all know is a reflection of what is happening internally so there are lots of institutions that he uh, weakened in the country and uh, of course the economy did quite well and i believe that is what brought him a lot of support his treatment of the pandemic i was just watching a bbc documentary yesterday that um, that detailed all the things that had gone wrong with the management of the pandemic situation in the united states from the from the you know consolidation of testing from the procurement of uh, ppes and masks and the way the american people were let down 
by the very government that they had elected to power. I mean, it, it's an, it is a national tragedy, I think, what has happened. The numbers of deaths that have occurred and the cases keep surging. The pandemic isn't going away. And this is America, number one, the hyperpower in the world, uh, brought to its knees by a virus and by imperfect, flawed, bad governance. But was that ignorance on his part? Or was it a the ta- was it a kind of tactics that he used in order to be away from uh, having the responsibility of dealing with this? This is not very clear because he went against all the science about the disease, and he he has the uh, capacity to understand these things. But why he did he adopt this reckless attitude towards it? Is there an explanation for it politically? It's a combination, I think, of several factors, but the dominant one being his complete disrespect for science, his contempt for expertise and experts, and uh, his uh, playing to the galleries, uh, literally playing to the galleries. I mean, he he was he was telling the people that uh, the economy is doing well, the jobs are coming back. Uh, this virus, uh, he used it, of course, in order to browbeat China and to turn it into an issue of opposition towards China. But as far as the people were concerned, he didn't warn them sufficiently about the dangers from the virus and about the need to take precautions. The death toll and the uh, fatalities could have easily been brought down if uh, those precautions had been taken. But I think essentially, he's a man who, who, who does not have any respect for science and for the scientists. Uh, for the experts, and uh, he believes. I mean, his his uh, his very very dominant uh, ego, his uh, his uh, megal- megalomania, as it were, his uh, you know his feelings of of self grandeur uh, dominated everything, and he believed that he could take charge of the situation and that everything would fall into place, and the people just had to follow. Something like the Pied Piper of Hamelin, he just drove the people down the cliff as it were. Well, so that the blood of 250,000 people is on his hands virtually. But um, no, what I'm wondering is only this, whether it was just ignorance or whether it was some kind of a political ploy like the China element or his distrust of science like in the case of climate change. So is there a method in that madness? That's my question. Well, I think there there obviously is a method in that uh, seeming madness, as it were. As I mentioned, the disrespect for science, the political reasons, exploiting it against China. But being an election year, he wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, he, uh, the uh, he, this uh, sort of lockdown and keeping the people indoors and shutting down businesses, he knew would impact the economy. He would He knew it would have a a fallout on the uh, economic well-being of the country, which has happened. And in an election year, that uh, certainly uh, would not have been to his advantage. So he uh, he must he, he obviously has exploited that situation, thinking it would turn out to his advantage. Uh, he was fortunate, of course, uh, to have come out of COVID after having caught it. Uh, which again within three days within three days like so, COVID. Yeah, it was a, it's a resurrection as it were <laughs> and, and he uh, i think that was also his way of telling the people that he is somebody who is invincible and uh, and he, uh, nothing can topple him over not even a defeat in the election <laughs> no but looking back at it it looks as though if there was no coronavirus he may have even won the election Oh, there is a theory like that? Absolutely. I think uh, he would have won the election if there had been no coronavirus. I I, I would agree with and that. And all his other all his other idiosyncrasies and faults would have been forgiven. I mean, that is the impression that one gets because this is the one which played out again all through the during the election campaign. So that exactly. I think he was he was not very wise in following this policy and he did not see what was coming as far as the election results are concerned. And if he had managed the pandemic better, that would have redounded to his credit. He would probably have, he would still have won the election if he had managed the situation better. Right. Of course, the other two issues were also there. The economic collapse 
as well as the racial conflict even on those he did not do maybe for the economic collapse he tried to do various things but, but um, on, yeah, the, on racial conflicts george floyd and so on he did not do much he did not do much and there were charges of racialism and racism made against him but what is uh, you know difficult to understand what is surprising is that uh, 18 to 19% of the african american electorate voted for mr trump in this right. election and, and the uh, hispanics was, and the hispanics. And hispanics and the hispanics and then he got florida because of that i mean there were hispanic dominated counties that went uh, to trump and the biden uh, the, the biden camp uh, has a lot of uh, soul searching and rethinking and uh, self correction to do on that front for future e- elections the democrats have a lot of thinking and introspection to do because they took it for granted that the minorities would not vote for trump and that <laughs> exactly. is that no but the hispanics in florida as you very well know are mostly the cuban exiles That's who right. came yes. away from cuba and therefore they are not really the the kind of minorities that you have elsewhere so these are the people who voluntarily came out because they hated castro and therefore they they, they don't have a leftist lenient in age as in the other case other cases of refugees etc so that may be the reason why the hispanics in florida voted differently that's understandable i think the hispanics in florida they are the cubans the venezuelans the colombians and the nicaraguans and they are all anti socialist i mean you mentioned right. the word socialism and they have an apocalyptic fit literally <laughs> so so you know that also I mean mr trump is the anti socialist and he you know is the is the personification of all that uh, Uh, no that's why men they cannot be characterized as minority at extent with socialist leanings mm, that was not there but that was for probably florida that way fell into his hands quite easily right. anyway coming to his successor he, he was vice president during your time right yes he so, was so what is your own assessment of the person uh i accompanied him in fact on his visit to india in the summer of 2013 and uh, he's a very convivial very uh, friendly old school politician uh, he loves you know to be among people and he's uh, uh, he's there's a, there's a genuine warmth about uh, mr biden i think which which uh, which people are drawn to him for that reason particularly of course he's very kind of fatherly very, figure he has right a fatherly now, figure kind of fatherly figure i would say in many senses because Uh, but he has been you know when mr obama picked uh, mr biden as his running mate in 2000 in the ele- in the to, uh, 2008 election our press in fact called him india friend biden that's how this is that's how the headlines were and he has always had an ambitious vision for the us india relationship that is something one has always identified with mr biden and the way you know he when he came to bombay he spoke about having some relatives in india with the with the same surname biden he he recounted how when he became senator for the first time in 1972 he received this letter from somebody in mumbai saying that uh, that he was also a biden and they were actually related because their great great grandfather served in the east india company and had gone to india married an indian woman and uh, this was the biden branch indian biden branch so he always speaks about it and how if he wants to run for election in india he could probably do that because he has a kind of support base with the bidens of india running behind him but if you recall even in 1998 you were there in washington those days after the pokra after the nuclear tests and when the us was so deeply upset and angry with india Uh, Mr Biden as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at the time he was the one who said we have to keep in mind our long term strategic interests as far as India is concerned and that we cannot that. we cannot isolate India India is not North Korea it's not Iraq those days they were talking about Iraq and that the United States has to engage India that was the refrain the biden refrain at that time 
uh, in a period when you know we had become quite ostracized in Washington. So he yes. was everyone turned against us. Exactly. And a few years later, when the civil nuclear deal was being negotiated, he became a critical ally again in the Senate uh, for India. And he was a, an unabashed proponent of the civil nuclear deal. And I think that it will tell you a little about the man and his approach, his orientation towards India. Uh, people say that he knows Pakistan also very well. So, you know, they talk about him having received the highest civilian nuclear civilian uh, decoration from uh, honor from Pakistan, the Nishane Pakistan. But that is because I think his his uh, dealings, his closeness to South Asia is well known. But he is not the kind of person who would, uh, you know, define our relationship with the United States on the basis of India's relationship with Pakistan. There's no hyphenation. There's nothing uh, that he that he superimposes on the importance of the U.S.-India relationship and the strategic convergence between our two countries. So, so in that sense, you know, when he talks about, he's all he's the one who said, I don't see any contradiction between strategic autonomy and strategic partnership that the two can go together. So, so he's a person, I think, um, who understands the ind indispensable nature of the partnership with India. Mr. Obama would always call it an indispensable partnership. And I think Mr. Biden understands the meaning of the word indispensable very well. And that is the approach I think will also help, which will also help when it comes to this whole rebalance that is taking place in the Indo-Pacific and, you know, the rise of China and India's place in this scenario. But after he ceased to be vice president, after President Obama left, some impression was generated, particularly among the Indian Americans and also some Indian circles here, that he is not particularly friendly with India and that probably because of his connections with Pakistan perhaps and also maybe in the last couple of years he made some comments about what is happening in India which all Democrats do in terms of religious freedom, in terms of press freedom etc. And um, naturally when he comes to power all this will change because uh, they will have a realistic appraisal of the situation between India and the United yeah. States at this point. And this is very important for us because only four days ago that we signed this new agreement, the United States, unprecedented kind of good relationship uh, between United States and India. And what you just said about, um, uh, you know, strategic autonomy becoming strategic partnership and the Americans thinking that through strategic autonomy, you could also have a strategic partnership with the United States, which we do not see perhaps. Mm -hmm. I do not know. So at that, some American scholars say that this is the problem with India because when they come so very close to you and you know that you need them, they need you, but then suddenly this old non-alignment comes into our minds and we all start uh, shying away from it. Mm -hmm. So, but if a partnership with the United States is not contradictory, it's actually not contradictory because sure. as a non-aligned country, we signed an agreement with the Soviet Union. Exactly. So it is quite possible. <laughs> it's quite possible. but. But this impression is there and I'm being asked by many people in the last few days, oh, will Biden be good for you because he is pro-Pakistani? This is a kind of talk, a kind of loose talk. That's why I asked you to tell us more about his personal approach to India. I don't think there will be any loose talk as far as uh, Mr. Biden is concerned, despite all the conviviality and the uh, uh, politicians approach to you know how you you press flesh and then you talk and and you you want to appear candid i i like the term that ambassador richard varma used recently when somebody asked him uh, you know about kamala harris really about her views on kashmir and you know what she'd been saying about um, the situation in india and he uh, said you know these are all parlor debates parlor debates. I mean, they happen, you know, in a situation when you're out of, uh, you know, you're not holding any position of, of actual responsibility when it comes to, you know, dealing uh, with other nations as part of your government. So these are pronouncements I think uh, we should be aware of, but I don't believe they are going to dictate the, the trend policy. and the direction and the policy of U.S.-India relations. From the American this, 
this is what i have been saying too saying that politicians out of power want to say things people like to hear so americans have this tendency to criticize religious intolerance in india and um, you know the situation in kashmir etc as individuals as democrats but once they have come to power they will realize where exactly the relationship stands anyway coming to kamala harris so uh, do you think that she will be of any particular advantage to us i wouldn't look at it that way uh, the fact that she is the vice president uh, you know she's the vice presidential candidate and will as i assume now that the election is short she, today, she is yeah. going to be vice president the fact that she is uh, partly indian american uh, and uh, as a woman of color i think it is a matter of satisfaction and of some pride to all of us as indians that here is the daughter of a indian woman immigrant who has risen to the second highest position in the united states so i think we should um, we should view her elevation to this position positively with a sense of positivity i don't believe we should be too judgmental about what she has said as i meant we discussed earlier these are positions that have been taken in a in another context in another situation i am sure that when she assumes the responsibilities of vice president she'll be guided by the the national interest of the united states and by the strategic interest of the united states in in crafting and cementing a closer relationship with india uh, not only uh, because of uh, you know the china factor and the security interests involved but because of you know the economic underpinning for this relationship and uh, the democratic values that i think ultimately uh, prevail whatever the extent of differences that we may have on a few issues here and there after all in any friendship even between people are bound to be differences it cannot be all together you know uh, absolute concord and agreement on every point of um, of relevance in the relationship so we should be prepared to discuss some of these issues and uh, and be able to at uh, address them with confidence rather than you know being too prickly about it and turning our backs on the united states or americans who raise such issues with us i think you know that will not happen government to government i'm not talking about that this is just the general perception but what i found was after that initial reaction mm -hmm. then they joined her you know the kind of money that the indian community raised Absolutely. and even the indian indian votes you know it used to be 80% maybe it came down to about 70% yeah but yeah. it did not go below that and the uh, people supported her there was general jubilation that she was there and also the pride that she is from tamil nadu and the tamil nadu people were also excited and all that yes. but of course i agree yeah. that she will work in the interests of united states and not of india and uh, but do you see her rise as part of the rise of indians in the united states do you connect it like that or you think it is a victory for minorities in general and uh, black people how do you assess that well i think it's definitely uh, an indication of uh, the rise of the indian diaspora uh, its success in, in the american mainstream and not just kamala harris i mean you just see the number of uh, indian americans even yeah. in the trump administration in the in the in the in uh, in the uh, house of representatives in the state legislatures in in the field of show business in the in the field of uh, the bureaucracy uh, you find uh, them uh, visible in in almost every field of american life today so this is an indication of the rise of uh, the indian american within the american mainstream and the manner in which this has happened i think has also contributed to the positive progress the onward movement that we have made in the us india relationship because they have also contributed a great deal to the progress of this relationship and the and uh, building a positive awareness of india in the american mind in the mainstream american mind and there was the value of indians in the way we have contributed to various ways So That's that may have contributed to her rise also, her ability and her style and exactly. functioning 
debating exactly. etc is part of that genius that they have already discovered mm-hmm. among the indians that's quite possible and mr biden constantly emphasizes you know the values that uh, indians and uh, the other americans share you know you know the family values and uh, uh, hard work education all these things uh, he keeps uh, emphasizing these commonalities that uh, bring indians and americans closer together right biden has already said that his first priority will be the corona virus and uh, then of course the economic situation as well as climate change these were the three priorities that he outlined how soon can you reverse this process is it is it going to be easy for him to suddenly change it back into a positive situation because during the election corona virus has in fact the infections have increased particularly in those very states where was this big battle going on and therefore the it is such a process that how soon will he be able to reverse it i don't believe he will be able to really uh, reverse it uh, quickly uh, i mean look at the pandemic situation uh, bringing down the fear, the uh, numbers of uh, infections uh, bringing down the death rate uh ensuring that uh, you know now when once the vaccine comes the whole issue of vaccine administration distribution there are huge priorities that the incoming administration will have to address and he says that also health care is going to be one of his topmost priorities the other one being infrastructure he's talking of uh, the jobs that need to be created the jobs that have gone away as a result of the pandemic so i think the inversion inward the focus on the domestic agenda will be quite natural for the incoming administration that is what the people want that is what you know the american uh, people people in the, the middle class and also in the rural economy i mean that is where the pain is being felt most the pain of economic decline and uh, the lack of employment the opioid uh, crisis you know the collapse literally of civil society in some parts of america so this is a country that really needs uh, needs to be treated uh, in a way that is able to heal all these wounds before you know you can really swing back into a situation uh, where america is again uh, you know at the head of the global table yes but then there are many things to be done in the international level also mm-hmm. so there are so many things that uh, mr trump has created situations which have to be rectified too first and foremost the leadership of the world that united states always had so that is something is also very urgent but i don't know how urgently he will be able to tackle that as you said domestic issues will dominate but maybe once a secretary of state is appointed and national security advisor etc the immediate thing that he has to do is first to reestablish uh, some faith in multilateralism the united mm-hmm. nations and the and the us's uh, role in the world and these you think he will quickly work on them in order to change the global situation i think it will definitely be a part of his um, his agenda he's always spoken about mr trump having abdicated american leadership in the world so obviously this is something uh, of concern to him secondly he keeps referring to the complex and urgent threats that face the world and that need you know america to be around in order to address these concerns so he speaks of salvaging situations rebuilding um, you know things that have been broken mobilizing to meet the new challenges so fighting authoritarianism for instance mr trump would uh, you know say good things about xi jinping and kim jong un uh, many times while at the same time you know also the like, opposite he also say the opposite so <laughs> <laughs> so I, he had as somebody said uh, i think maggie haberman of the new of uh, earlier from the new york post but now 
in the White House press uh, corps. She says Mr. Trump had impulse control issues. I think that was the, the, the trouble with him and controlling those impulses. I don't think Mr. Mr. Biden will have that. He keeps talking about transparency in global governance and in things like World Health Organization. I believe that he will again rebuild American connections and ties with the World Health Organization. He would want to cooperate on the global health front in order to deal with this pandemic and future pandemics. It's a real tragedy that all the steps that the Obama administration had put in place to deal with pandemics have been consciously dismantled by Mr. Trump in the first few years of his presidency. And America has paid very heavily for that. So, so Mr. Trump also speaks about a foreign policy for the middle class a foreign policy for the middle class, the American middle class. And I think that's where, you know, issues like trade and um, uh, how, how you can tap foreign markets to bring America advantage, lead the charge on global innovation. Uh, I don't think he will enter into you know, any new trade agreements for the moment because there are, you know, issues to be handled domestically. He has to really read the tea leaves on that. Coming to China, I think it will be, as he has said, a special challenge for this administration. He understands that China is playing a long game. This is a long game and therefore this uh, contradiction in US-China relations is not going away. China is posing a real economic threat to the United States. He keeps saying how China has robbed America of its technology, intellectual property, how it has reaped unfair advantage. I'm sure many in the rest of the world would also agree uh, with that viewpoint. I think he will be prepared to cooperate with China in certain areas, climate change, for instance, non-proliferation and global health, global health security. But he would be willing to take on China in concert with other friends and partners in other fields. And that is where, you know, uh, the defense security relationship that we have with the United States and um, uh, which I think you also referred to uh, would be an area which he would want to strengthen further so that we can collectively be able to shape the rules of the road, uh, whether it's on security, whether it's on a new architecture, rule-based architecture for the Indo-Pacific, uh, for a more transparent um, diplomacy when it comes uh, to how countries in the region deal with each other and uh, and also the peaceful settlement of disputes in other words he will be soft towards china you think i think he believes diplomacy and not force should be the instrument of american power but if there is a, a crisis, for instance, in Taiwan uh, and, you know, the Chinese overstep the boundaries and uh, the situation really um, deteriorates and we have a crisis on our hands. I hope that this will, that will, it will not come to that pass or it will not happen in the early stages of the Biden administration. I believe then, you know, the rubber hits the road, literally. I don't believe it's going to be just diplomacy. Uh, so, but the Chinese strategy is not to confront that. They do it slowly and gradually and they're trying to assume or, or step into the vacuum left by the Americans, etc. So even in the case of India, you know, it's a kind of limited, orchestrated, slow uh, actions to basically uh, assert its influence and importance and so on. So uh, an, uh, an open confrontation is not expected. But the it's, problem is the process of attrition. Yeah. But the in Indo-Pacific area, the interest was shown at the time of President uh, um, uh, President Obama himself. His 2015 visit was really for the sake of the Indo-Pacific, and uh, you know the agreement that was reached in Delhi. Otherwise, he would not have come a second time. And therefore, that at that time we were a bit reluctant. We did not want the quadrilateral. We didn't want to provoke China. China is our neighbor. And that kind of hesitations we had. And those hesitations we could even see recently in Singapore and in Delhi. Even during the 2 plus 2, we won't uh, say the C word <laughs> and so on. So we are still hesitating. 
but the americans have taken a much more forward position particularly mr pompe i like him very much because he is he is probably <laughs> the best friend of india in the context of china he doesn't even say um china he says communist party of china he says chairman of the communist party of china so all that will change though don't you think because it will be more subtle and nuanced it will change and it will be more subtle as you said more nuanced and there will be a lot of old hands on deck people who have handled china in the past people who have been in the state department so the old experts uh, will uh, put their stamp i'm sure on the approach to china but i don't believe that engagement will be restored and uh, the process of decoupling uh, will somehow uh, be stalled because i think the whole of america whether democrat or republican uh, and across the spectrum of public opinion there is this feeling that china as i said has reaped unfair advantage from its relationship with the united states so uh, so what what we can expect a, a rocky period in us china relations uh, china in fact uh, it's interesting to see how the chinese um, media has been reacting to the election results i believe in the last few days uh, they have opened the flood gates in social media uh, to talk about the elections and there are a lot of memes floating around about trump about trump actually being a secret agent for the chinese communist party because he actually helped china more than uh, brought disadvantage to it but slowly i believe in the last day or two there's a lot of coverage of mr biden mr biden as you know is a leader who spent about 15 16 hours with xi jinping when xi jinping was vice president before he became president of of uh, china so he knows xi jinping he has dealt with him before so they have some degree of personal knowledge of each other we'll have to see whether that will be uh, will be utilized uh to uh you know to for for Mr Biden to craft a future policy towards China based on that knowledge uh but overall i think he's going to pursue a very uh clear headed and uh, a more hard nosed approach uh, to China than the Obama administration did i think in, on that i don't believe we should have any any doubt but they have an urgent problem with china in the sense that they have now occupied more of our land and it has become increasingly embarrassing for the government that this situation prevails and we have been doing everything possible whether it is diplomacy whether it is acquisition of arms whether it is um, economic activity economic restrictions etc and nothing seems to be moving so the way it appeared was that perhaps the agreement that uh, we have with the americans would have a sobering impact on the chinese do you see that happening well i believe the chinese are certainly sensitive to all that we are doing with the united states and you know the last foundational agreement that we signed the beka when mr pompeo and mr esper were here last week certainly uh, you know was taken a very serious note of by china so they see this um, rebalancing the strategic rebalancing that is taking place uh, in our in their neighborhood and uh, us and india coming much closer together and it's a direct consequence of china's assertiveness and its uh, aggressiveness uh, towards neighbors especially on issues of territory territory and sovereignty so china has a lot to answer really for what uh, is happening vis-a-vis these moves these strategic moves that we see in in our region so that is why i said you know even if mr trump is going out of power and we have a new administration in in the white house the us india relationship really transcends these changes it transcends pers- no. is it transcends politics and uh, but like uh, the us i think we also although you are right when you say nothing is really uh, nothing uh, of uh, uh, substantive has happened in the relationship with china in terms of the disengagement that we want the ds de- escalation that we want in the last few months but we are talking to each other and i believe that uh, 
the government had the, the Indian government has handled the situation with maturity and restraint. I think uh, one one will have to, uh, you know, say that, and one will have to uh, agree that the situation is to be handled with restraint because I don't believe it is in our interest to have an irreversible break in our relations with China. Well, Nirupama, we have not seen any direct reaction by China, have you, on the uh, new agreement that we have signed with the United States? Have they directly commented on it? Not perhaps, but I think um, their spokesman is asked from time to time about the new closeness between India and the United States. And I think most of the criticism from the Chinese side has been directed against the United States. So the Chinese reaction to the growing proximity between India and the United States has not been positive. It was not expected to be positive. And uh, the fact that we have now completed the signing of all these foundational agreements with the United States uh, has not been uh, seen positively, obviously, by China. And it comes at a time when we have serious problems in our bilateral relationship between India and China. So altogether, it makes for a fairly complicated and serious situation where we will have to be very deft and agile as far as our diplomacy is concerned and the manner in which we achieve that balancing that we need internally and externally when it comes to dealing with China. Uh, but the uh, Contact and communication with China has not broken down as a result. I don't believe it is the intention on either side for that to happen. So the efforts to disengage and de-escalate do continue. But at the same time, I, it should be understood that our closeness to the United States is a given and it is going to be a part of the strategic rebalancing that we are. All right. I think Chinese reaction has been adverse in response to your question as to whether they have reacted to our uh, latest, the latest developments after the 2 plus 2 meeting uh, with the Secretary of State and the US Defense Secretary. So the reaction has been adverse. Uh, the state media talks about such efforts uh, being bound to fail. Those are the words that they have used. Yes, this is true that China may have some anxiety about our relationship with the US. But India keeps repeating that we will not be in an alliance with any country in the world. So this does, it, it may be, give some comfort to the Chinese, but it may make the Americans a little bit uncomfortable. So they are seeing, they are now dealing with Australia and Japan, which are allies of the United States anyway. So India stands out in that group. And the idea was to bring India into it through this defense partnership and these agreements, etc. So, which will be better for us? The comfort that we give to the China, Chinese or the discomfort that we give to the Americans? Or do you think that this position we should change and not say that we are any kind of alliance? I don't think either India or the United States is looking to establish an alliance between themselves. So, that really is not a factor that is a determinant in, in the sense of what we are doing together India and the United States. There is a much closer alignment of interests, definitely. Secondly, that strategic rebalancing has is taking place. And um, when we talk of uh, multi-alignment and multipolarity, in a balanced multipolarity that deals with the asymmetries of power that many countries in the region face vis-a-vis -vis China and leaving the United States apart, I think these are very legitimate steps that India is taking and I think that the understanding and the and the um, harmonization of interests between India and the United States is very much in evidence. So today there is a harmonization of interests and alignment of interests and concerns between India and the United States. So this natural partnership that we have spoken about for so many years is now really being expressed not just in thought, but also in action. Okay, Nirupama, finally, what is your prognosis on the LAC between India and China? How is it, how is it going to be resolved, you think? I hate to sound uh, pessimistic, 
but i think uh, first of all the situation is very complicated secondly it's very different from the kinds of uh, transgressions and violations of the lac that we saw in uh, past years uh, thirdly we are dealing with a china that is increasingly assertive and inflexible on issues concerning territory and sovereignty you see their attitude in the south china sea and now you're seeing it on the land borders uh, with india and uh, what is perhaps one silver lining is the fact that india and china have been restrained in their reactions to the situation uh, despite the tragic events in galwan on june the 15th efforts to deescalate and disengage are ongoing uh, the two foreign ministers have been in contact so uh, the avenues for diplomacy have not been exhausted but at the same time this has be, been an inflection point in the india china relationship and the fallout as of the events in galwan and the events across the lac have profoundly disturbed this relationship as the foreign minister said recently so to answer your question the prognosis is not very uh, comforting to say the very least but one can only hope that the situation can be managed and tensions can deescalate but ultimately this border issue this difference between india and china is very much today a dispute you know we keep saying we don't want differences to become disputes differences have become disputes so let us hope that the change in the united states and probably the global situation will have a salutary effect on this particular situation also because there could be a change in chinese attitude that the americans are not leaving the leadership of the world and therefore they may become a little more sober and that seems to be the only silver lining that we can see so in that on that happy note or optimistic note thank you very much for joining me today to tea, to have tea with me even though only online but one day i hope we'll be able to have tea together not in the distant future thank you very much nirupama thank you so much ambassador thank you very much and enjoyed the discussion and look forward to future interactions thank you thank you thank you very much Thank you.